What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $700 and for that price you're getting some really good performance taking into account the current market. This is a system capable of gaming and streaming all of today's most popular titles along with most modern AAA titles at 60 plus FPS. This is going to be a full build guide meaning I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put this system together step by step. This system is using all new parts with the exception of the graphics card and should be a great placeholder until GPU pricing returns to normal and you can get a more modern graphics card. While there are obviously tons of different ways you could have spent this budget, I went with parts that I know are quality, that will work well together and will last you a long time. Now before we get further into the video, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, VIP Your CD Key. If you're building a new PC or are just tired of the annoying activate Windows watermark, then you can actually get Windows 10 for under $15 thanks to today's sponsor, VIP Your CD Key. This is a 100% legal OEM Windows key that can even be used to upgrade to Windows 11. To get and use a key, all you have to do is head to the link in the description and once signed in, select buy now and then enter MAT25 to get the full discount. Then hit submit order, go through the checkout process and within a minute or two of checking out, you'll receive your key here. To use it, click the Windows icon in the bottom left, search and go to activation settings, select change product key, paste in the key, hit next, and boom you have activated Windows 10 for under $15. Make sure to check out the link in the description and use the code MAT25 and thanks again to VIP your CD key for sponsoring this video. So now getting back to the build, like I said before this is going to be a great system for gaming and even streaming and light video editing. Before I show you how to put this system together, I first want to talk about all the parts going into this PC. The first thing to talk about is the CPU, as other than the graphics card this has the biggest impact on gaming performance and determines a number of other things for the build. What I went with is the Intel Core i5-10400F, which comes in at right around $140 depending on where you look. This is 6 core CPU with hyper threading which makes it great for not just gaming but also for heavily multi-threaded applications like streaming and light video editing. The CPU can turbo all the way up to 4.3 GHz and is a great option for mid-range systems. This chip is locked so there isn't the ability to overclock but stock performance is still very respectable. If you can find it for the same price, another option is the normal 10400 which features integrated graphics. This can be very helpful for troubleshooting a system or for running your system without a graphics card. Overall this is a very good jack of all trades CPU that should last a very long time. Now the 10400F does come with a stock cooler which is adequate but there was some money left in the build so I decided to pick up an aftermarket cooler for lower temps, improved acoustics, and subjectively improved aesthetics. What I went with is the Johnsbo CR1000. I picked this up for just over $20 and for that price it's a really good value. This is a tower style cooler with a 120mm RGB fan. It has 4 copper heat pipes and a pretty substantial aluminum fin array. Beyond this, the white color matches very nice with the rest of the build. The cooler runs ultra quiet with this 10400 and you'll be able to see temps in the benchmark section of the video. Moving on to the motherboard, I decided to go for something that was a good step up from the very basic boards but still was offering a good value for the price. What I went with is the Asus Prime B560 Plus. This is an ATX board which features 4 DIMM slots, a decent VRM setup, and plenty of PCIe expansion. Now there is one caveat that I need to mention which is the fact only one of the two M.2 slots will work with this configuration. This is because the 10th gen CPU we went with does not support gen 4 drives, so the top slot is disabled in this case. This is disappointing but not the end of the world in my opinion, and if you really wanted the top slot working you could go for an 11th gen i5 over this 10th gem one. The back panel on this board is decent and I think the black and silver color scheme works really well with this build. Next let's talk about the RAM. I decided to look for a relatively budget RAM kit as Intel CPUs don't benefit from fast RAM as much as AMD CPUs do. What I ended up grabbing was a 2x8GB kit of silicon power DDR4 RAM rated to run at 3200MHz CL16. Again this isn't anything fancy but at a little over $50 the value it offers is great. 16GB is enough for modern gaming and is even enough for streaming and light video editing. One other nice thing is the fact this kit will only take up two of the four DIMM slots meaning upgrading in the future will be as easy as popping in two more 8GB sticks. 
Moving on to the SSD, I looked at a bunch of options, but in the end, I decided to go with the tried and trusted Western Digital Blue SM550. This is a budget NVMe drive, but at only $43 for the 500GB model, it's an insane value in my opinion. Read and write speeds are good, especially compared to any SATA drive, and I've used this particular one in a ton of builds and have never had a problem with it. 500GB is plenty for your OS, applications, and a modest games library. Because this drive is in the ultra compact M.2 format, it means installation is super simple and takes less than a minute to install. If 500GB isn't enough, you can always upgrade storage in the future, which is one of the easier upgrades to do, or you could go for the 1TB model of this drive for more storage out of the gate. The next thing to talk about is of course the graphics card. If we were in an alternate universe where you could buy a GPU at MSRP, then something like a 1660 Super would be a great option for this build around the $200 price point, but unfortunately we have to deal with the current market. With the budget of $200 shopping on eBay, the best card we can get are the GTX 970 or R9 290. After putting some thought into it, I decided to go for the GTX 970. This is an older card at this point, but it still performs really well and will work great as a placeholder while you wait for a better deal on a modern graphics card. Any esports games like Fortnite and Valorant this will play with ease and many modern AAA titles are playable at 1080p with 60 plus FPS if you're willing to play around with these settings. With all this being said, the GTX 970 overall worked very well in this build and while it's not ideal, it does get the job done. Moving on to the power supply, I knew I needed a budget unit for this build, but I still wanted it to be reliable and of good quality. What I went for is the EVGA 510BP. Like the name implies, this is a 510 watt, 80 plus bronze rated power supply that comes in at only $35. EVGA is a brand I trust a lot and out of the dozens of units I've purchased from them, I haven't had a single failure occur. 510 watts is more than enough for this build and even gives you headroom to upgrade to a more powerful graphics card or CPU later down the line. One nice thing about this unit is that even though it is non-modular, it uses all black sleeve cables which keeps the build looking super clean. Finally, let's talk about the case. When I saw the Montec X2 Mesh on sale for only $45, I knew I had to pick it up. With that being said, I valued it at $60 in the budget as this is closer to the normal going rate. Even at the higher price, this still offers an amazing value for the money. It has a tempered glass side panel, power supply basement, full mesh front panel, three included LED fans, and the list goes on. One big thing to note is the fact the fans are a static RGB color and do not change. This is not a big deal to someone like me who likes the rainbow look, but for a lot of you it may be a deal breaker. With all this being said, I love the way this case looks, it's pretty easy to build in and I can highly recommend it. All in all, for $700, you're getting a set of parts that are high quality, reliable, and should last you for a long time. So now that you have an understanding of each of the parts and why I picked them, I'm now going to show you how to put this system together step by step. To build this PC, you need a normal size Phillips head screwdriver, a smaller one for the M.2 drive, and possibly a pair of pliers. Make sure you have an open area to work in and have blocked off an hour or so to put this guy together. With your parts in hand, your tools ready to go, and your workspace cleared, it means it's now time to start assembling your new PC. You can start by getting out your motherboard box, open it up and grab the board itself, along with the IO shield and the small M.2 standoff slash screws. Now place the board on top of the box and grab your CPU box. You can pull out the CPU plastic shell and open it up, but don't pull the CPU out of it yet. Go back to your motherboard and bring your attention to the center of the board, press down and open on the metal retention arm then lift it up flipping open the socket cover. Grab your CPU handling it by the edges and line the little triangle on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Once lined up, lower it down applying no pressure it should just slip into place. Once it's in you can lower the socket cover down then return the metal retention arm to its starting position like this. The plastic socket cover will pop off, this is fine and make sure to keep this in case you need to RMA your board or sell it in the future. Now grab your CPU cooler, flip it upside down and install these two metal brackets like this with the four included screws. Now open the included packet of thermal paste and apply a pea sized amount to the center of the CPU IHS. Next take the included Intel backplate and place it under the motherboard so you can see the standoff sticking through. You can now lower the CPU cooler down like this lining up the metal screws with these standoffs in the backplate. Now tighten down all four screws a few turns at a time going across pattern until the cooler is secured. Next take the fan and orient it like this on the cooler, then you can take the wire mounts and secure the fan to the cooler like this. Now grab the CPU fan cable and locate the CPU fan header to the top right of the cooler, line the notch in the cable connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. 
Next, I just took the excess cable length and tried to clean it up by tucking it away as much as I could. With that complete, your CPU and cooler are successfully installed and we can move on to the RAM. We're going to be installing our sticks into slots 2 and 4, which are the gray ones. Start by opening the clips on both ends of each slot. Take your first stick of RAM and orient it so the notch in the stick lines up with the notch in the slot. Once lined up, lower it down and press in both ends until you hear a clicking noise and see the clip snap shut. Now just take your second stick of RAM and install it in slot 4 the same way you did it for the other stick. With that done, your RAM is successfully installed and we can move on to installing our SSD. Get out your SSD and bring your attention to the M.2 slot towards the bottom of the board. Take one of the M.2 standoffs and screw it into the hole here. Now take your SSD and line the notch in it with the notch in the slot and insert it at an angle like this. Now you can hinge it down and secure it with the M.2 screw we pulled out of the motherboard box earlier. With that done, you can put your motherboard to the side and grab out your case box. With your case out, lay it on its side and remove the four thumb screws securing the glass panel. You can now lift the panel away like this and move to the side. Next, with the case back on its feet, you can remove the two back panel screws, then pull on the handle to release it, then set it to the side. Next, pull out the baggie which contains all the screws necessary to build this PC. You can also now push this bundle of wires to the back of the case like this. You can now set the case on its side and remove these two standoffs. Just do this however you can, either with your fingers, pliers, or using a nut driver like me. Now reinstall these two standoffs into the two holes here and here. With those two in, grab the IO shield we removed from the box earlier, take it and orient it like this, then lower it down to the IO cutout. Once lined up, press in each corner in one at a time until the IO shield is in place and secure. With that done, you can take your motherboard, handling it by its cooler, and lower it in like this, lining the I.O. on the board with the I.O. shield, and making sure you can see the standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. Now take six motherboard screws that look like this, and install one into each of the holes with the standoff beneath it. Order doesn't matter, just make sure they're all secure. With that done, you can flip the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply. Take it with the fan facing down and push it into the case like this. Line up the holes in the power supply with the holes in the case, then use the four screws that come with the power supply or four from the case screw bag and install one into each of the four holes. It's now time to start routing cables. Start by taking the 8-pin CPU cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Next, take the 24-pin cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. You can now take the blue USB 3 cable and push it through the hole below the 24 pin through here. Now grab the HD audio cable and push it through this hole here. Next take the USB 2 cable and push it through that same hole. Now take all the little front panel connectors and push them through this hole here. Now you can take the PCIe power cable and push it through the same cutout that the USB 3 went through. Next take one of the Molex power connectors from the power supply that looks like this and plug it into the back of the Molex chain right here. We can now flip the case onto its side to start plugging things in. Start by bringing your attention to the top left of the motherboard and by grabbing our CPU power cable. Plug it into the CPU power header by lining the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header then pressing it into place. With that done we can move to the right side of the case where we'll be plugging in the 24 pin and USB 3. Start by taking the 24 pin making sure it's pressed together, line up the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header and press it into place. For USB 3, just take the connector and line the bump out on it with the cutout on the header and press it into place. We can now move our attention to the bottom of the board starting at the left side. Take the HD audio cable and bring it to the HD audio header on the motherboard with the HD audio text facing down, line it up and press it into place. Next take the USB 2 cable and plug it into one of the two open headers with the USB text facing up. Now we can plug in the pesky front panel connectors, start with the power LED ones and plug them into the top two left pins with the positive green one to the left. Now take the HDD LED connector and plug it in directly below the power LED, again with the positive to the left. Next take the power switch connector and press it in directly to the right of the power LED. Finally, take the reset switch and press it in below the power switch. Orientation of both these switch connectors doesn't matter. With all those cables plugged in, we're now ready to start the process of installing the GPU. At the back of this case, loosen the screw, lift up the cover, then tighten it back down. Now remove the top two PCIe I.O. covers by removing the screw and lifting the first one away, then by bending the second one back and forth until it snaps off and you can lift it away. 
Now you can open the PCIe lock on the top slot like this and grab your graphics card. Line the notch in the PCIe slot with the notch in the card and press it into place making sure the lock snaps shut. Now at the back of the case you can lower the cover back down and secure the GPU with one or more of these screws. Now you can take your PCIe power cable and lining up the clip and bump out press it into place. With that done everything is installed but we have one more thing to do before closing the system up which is cable management. Basically just pull any excess cable link to the back of the case and tuck it away slash try to make it as flat as possible so the back panel can easily be reinstalled. Just make sure the main chamber looks nice and the cables are flat and you're gonna be fine. Now you can press the back panel on like this and re-secure the two thumb screws. Now with the case on its side, put the glass panel on after removing the plastic, which I didn't do in this clip, then reinstall the four screws securing the panel in place. Now your build is technically complete, but there are a few more things that need to be done software wise before you can start gaming and streaming. The first order of business is installing the OS. You can run Windows 10 free unactivated with the only downside being a little watermark or purchase a key super cheap from today's sponsor, again linked in the description. I'm not going to show you how to install Windows in this video, but I'll link a tutorial on how to do this in the description down below, so make sure to check that out if you don't know how to install Windows. Next you need to install drivers. For the graphics drivers head to nvidia's website linked in the description select geforce 900 series and 970 then press search now just download the latest version open it up and do the express install with that done you're ready to start downloading and enjoying some games Speaking of games, it's now time to talk about gaming performance. I tested five different games which should give you a good idea of overall performance of this system. Starting off with Borderlands 3, a relatively hard to run AAA title, I tested this at 1080p medium settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 75 FPS average with 1% lows of 58. This is pretty good performance in my opinion and shows that this system is perfectly capable of running AAA titles at 1080p with 60 plus FPS. Next up is Fortnite, which I tested at 1080p Pro settings in a Team Rumbles match, which is kind of a worst case scenario. Doing this, I saw an overall average of 156 with 1% lows of 54. Again, this is pretty good performance in my opinion, and it's good to see it's able to play this game at 1080p Pro settings with an average above 144 FPS. Next up is Valorant, which is an easy to run esports game. I test this at 1080p low in a deathmatch. Doing this resulted in a 216 FPS average with 1% lows of 115. This performance overall is really good and should be great for competitive play. Next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, another difficult to run AAA game. I test this at 1080p medium and saw a 65 FPS average with 1% lows of 48 in the built in benchmark. Again, seeing above 60 FPS is pretty good in my opinion. Next up is Rainbow Six Siege, which I tested at high using the built-in benchmark at 1080p. Doing this resulted in an impressive 181 FPS average with 1% 1 lows of 141. Overall, this system performs pretty good in gaming. Sure, you would have been able to get a lot more performance if GPUs were going for MSRP, but that isn't the reality we're living in right now, and for $700, this is offering some pretty good value in my opinion. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you guys keep watching them, then I will keep making them. Again, thanks to vip your CD key for sponsoring this video. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.